Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another interview. I am excited to begin. But before we introduce our guest, I had a very quick announcement, which is that I was on the Cover Stories with Chess Life podcast. So hopefully, listeners, you guys already know about the work that they're doing over at U.S. Chess with their monthly podcasts. Um, One comes out every Tuesday, and they have separate feeds. I'll link to them all in the show description. But one week before this one came out, I did an interview with friend and and uh, popular guest of the show, John Hartman, who's now hosting Cover Stories with Chess Life. So I know over the years, you guys, or some of you, have asked uh, to hear me interviewed about sort of the story of perpetual chess and um, my life and you know what I think of contemporary chess and all that stuff. So it was a fun, long interview with John. So if that interests you, you should check it out. By the way, they've had some issues with their podcast feed. Um, They have not been able to get it on the big sites like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I know it's been super frustrating for John and others, but that is now rectified. So I'll link to it in the show description. It's actually a separate feed. So if you were subscribed before, then you need to subscribe again and you will get uh, you'll get to hear my interview or skip my interview and move on to the big shots who are usually on cover stories with Chess Life. Um, So with all that out of the way, though, I'd like to introduce our guest. Uh, who is the two-time National Women's Champion of the Czech Republic and a frequent participant in the U.S. Women's Championship. So she's been a top female player in two countries now. And she's as she's been living in the States um, over the past, uh, we'll find out how many years, five to ten, I'm guessing, she's been piling up the academic credentials. She has a BS and a master's and is currently getting a Ph.D. in communications at the University of Arizona. She is also a chess teacher. Um, and in her ample free time is doing beloved lectures for Jen Shahadi's Popular Girls Club Zoom series. She's also does individual lessons. Um, and now we are going to give her a chance to speak for herself. Woman Grandmaster Katarina Nemsova, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to finally chat. You're one of the many people that we just, you know, you've been on my list. I've been wanting to invite you, wanting to invite you and waiting for the right time. And actually, I invited you even before the Queen's Gambit explosion. Um, but it's it's good timing because we need the female perspective, Katerina. I mean, I sit here and wax philosophical and I apologize if any listeners are getting Queen's Gambit fatigue, but I do think it's important to, to hear what a top woman chess player thinks about it. So the timing couldn't be better. So my first question for you, Katerina, is um, how, how has it impacted your life, if at all, um, other than I'm guessing constant conversations about it with non-chess <laughs> people in your life? I mean, the Queen's Gambit, that's just amazing what it did for chess. And, you know, the direct impact for me, like, for example, I was going for my Starbucks, you know, coffee in the morning, and there were people stopping me at a bus stop, and I had like a chess shirt. And this guy came to me and was like, oh, do you play chess? And I was like, yeah, I do. And the next question was, are you a grandmaster? And I was like, <laughs> wow, like, you know, what are the odds, right? So I was like, yes, I am. And I started to talking. And then I thought, you know, the last time I was asked if I was a grandmaster, and I don't think like ever by a stranger. So I think now the, you know, the Queen's Gambit is doing so much for people thinking about chess. I mean, amazing game, so elegant, so beautiful, but also about women being strong and being, um, you know, good players. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And Netflix um, recently published some, some statistics about Queen's Gambit. Um, at last count, it was like 62 million people have seen it. I mean, just absolutely staggering numbers. It was uh, the number one show in over 50 countries. Um, yeah, so- I've, I looked at the map and I was like, wow, it's everywhere. You know, it's not just U.S., but it's like everywhere how the show is expl- expanding. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, just just great to see. Um, so how how soon into its release? I know you're super busy getting your PhD. So did you watch it like as soon as it came out or did it take you a while to get around to it? Actually, it took some time because, yes, I'm busy with my PhD. I'm teaching. Uh, and also, truth to be told, there's a lot of like chess movies. And it's like, OK, it's great for 
you know, for general public, but sometimes it's not uh, so great for chess players. And I get very addicted to TV shows. So I knew that when I'm going to start watching, I'm going to just do it in like, you know, one sitting or two. <laughs> so I wanted to find time when I feel like mentally prepared to watch it. And so I watched it like, I think two, three weeks ago. Um, yeah. Okay. But it was amazing. And- so you you do you have any like critiques of it at all, or do you give a ten out of ten? How how do you rate it overall? I mean, the like the storyline is great. Like the way it portrays chess is absolutely fantastic. You know, you think about chess movies like Searching for Bobby Fischer, Knights of the South Bronx, or Pawn Sacrifice. It's like it shows you know kids. Or actually, Pawn Sacrifice, not, but maybe Brooklyn Castle, like kids winning trophies and kids, you know, really being happy for uh, for playing good chess. But it's kind of different because when you switch from being a kid to being an adult, then the chess is usually portrayed like uh, a very kind of depressing thing, uh, like, you know, Pawn Sacrifice of Life of the King, like prisoners playing chess. It, the perspective is not like it's beautiful, elegant game and like you should play it. It's fun. You know, and now the Queen's Gambit just shows... The game is just fantastic. I mean, you see the boom. Like, I I have people like asking me about chess. Like, friends, you know, who knew that I am a chess player but never really cared suddenly ask me, you know, uh, sending me questions and just wanting to chat about chess, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Of course, our aforementioned mutual friend Jen Shahadi been in the Washington Post, wrote an article in the Washington Post, been featured in the New York Times and NPR, and and it, yeah, it's just. It's crazy to see. And I feel like for the like, as you're alluding to, for the first time, it, it feels like people really they get it in a way that they never did before. It was always sort of or at least not not always and not by everyone. But certainly there's been a perception of it being this sort of, uh, you know, dark, uh, musty subculture, whereas they were able to capture it in a glamorous light and, you know, focus on the traveling and you know the intrigue and the the obsession, but without casting the obsession negatively. So mm-hmm. definitely, it's it's fun to see. Yeah, and like when you think about players, I also saw that like Marcel and Efroimsky from Israel was you know interviewed about that. Like girls from all the countries that are like the tops there, I feel they are being interviewed by their televisions or like radio stations, which is pretty cool. And one thing why I think you know Queen's Gambit is really popular is that it's also shown from shown from female perspective. Like uh, it's shown it's something like special, maybe even like sexy, like cool. You know, it's it's uh, I think they did a really good job in this way for uh, for showing it as uh, I don't I don't even know how to describe it, but like uh, not as a competitive thing, but like a really good game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Katarina, you come from a family of seven chess players, which is amazing. Um, And I know that it's mostly, I believe you said you have one brother and four sisters. So lots of female chess players in the family. And one thing I wondered about in one of the mild critiques that I've seen raised is, you know, from um, not not just women in the chess world, but women who've ascended any male dominated field saying there's no way that um, Beth would be treated so nicely. You know, <laughs> that, that everyone's so supportive. There's no obnoxious <laughs> men denigrating her at all. You know, during the show, uh, does does that critique ring true with you? Absolutely. I mean, there is a theme when like Beth wins and like everybody starts clapping, the opponent starts clapping, and I just started to laugh. Like that would never ever happen. Like your opponent clapping, a guy that you know that lost to you would clap on your victory. Just never ever. Uh, I mean, even women would never clap that you won. But like for guys, it's even just a. Uh, you know, just a crazy imagination. I really hard, you know, laughed hard because it was just so funny. And also, you know, there are no rude remarks. Like you would hear, yeah, like, exactly. you know, I was playing, you know, a, a woman and I lost because her dress was too tight or her her, her blouse was see-through or, you know, too revealing or uh, I just played a woman and I felt uncomfortable. Like all those things, you know, that you just never hear in that TV show, but you would in real life and every, you know, competitive female chess player heard that about herself or about others. So I think, but on the other hand, I'm happy they are not really plugging it there yet because that could, uh, you know, again, portray the criticism of the game and maybe not many people would like it. I think maybe in future uh, episodes or season, if there are gonna be, and I think there are because I saw some Magnus saying that he played in one or something uh, Hmm, on Facebook. So I think when they start like looking into those details, that would be, um, that would be really cool, yes. 
Wow. Well, I'm not sure about the future seasons for the record. That's <laughs> that's one of those we'll have to we'll have to fact check that on our own and uh, chase it down. Um, that would be awesome if there was. Um, so can you think of, I mean, I don't want to, like you say, I don't want to um, harp on the negative too much, but how often were you encountering comments of that nature or overhearing comments about that, na that of that nature as you were coming up in the uh, chess world, Katerina? You know, once uh, I was looking at like a commentary of Susan Polgar, like maybe I read it in her book and she was saying how she never won with a healthy man that every time she beat a man, the man would say like, oh, I'm a little sick right. or I had a headache, that's why I lost. And I think hearing these uh, kind of excuses for losing, uh, I think that's very common. Like yeah. I I heard that very often that there was always reason, you know, why, uh, why the person lost and it was not because I was strong. It was some extra issues happening during that time. Yeah, and Susan Polgar, who of course, you know from your time at Webster, she also tweeted recently, that um, there, she didn't name the person, but she said there was a top 10 player who at some point when she was like coming up and, you know, competing at the, the world-class level told her that women belong in the kitchen. She said a top 10 Soviet player. She didn't, didn't name who it was, but that, you know, that's awful to hear. Um, and yeah, I mean, but it's so, not very uncommon, you know, like you, we may think it's like a one individual occasion that somebody said that, but there are a lot of strong men who who just don't think that, you know, women can be strong in chess or should be competing. Uh, I think that's really, I mean, it is a male dominating, dominating field uh, and it's just hard for male to kind of let, uh, you know, make space for women. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it is getting better. The Polgar certainly um, carved out some real estate for women in the chess world with their accomplishments. Um, so what do you say, like any any woman who might be listening or who comes up to you and is, has, a renew, has a new interest in chess and wants to pursue chess, uh, what advice would you give them? I mean, I would tell them to definitely watch the show or finish watching the show and then start learning slowly, you know, attend classes. Now I know Jennifer Shahadi started a class for female beginners. There's a lot of YouTube content, Twitch content. I mean, tons of coaches everywhere. Uh, so I would encourage them to just start playing, start learning, start being, I mean, if they're interested, I would just try to boost that because we need as many women in chess, as many girls as, as possible. And I think the more there is of us, the better we can, you know, make a, make a change. Yeah. And yeah, that's one of the great, many great initiatives um, undertaken by U.S. chess women and, and uh, Jen Shahadi. She also uh, launched a new monthly book club called the Mad Woman's Book Club, where a bunch of people, a bunch of women predominantly get together on Zoom. They read a book, they discuss it. Sometimes they're even having the authors join in. Um, and it's not uh, not automatic, not, uh, excuse me, not uh always going to be about chess. Like I think they're reading one of uh, Maria Konnikova, who's a writer for the New Yorker and has written uh, chess tangential books about like Sherlock Holmes and poker and stuff like that. They're having her on soon. I think they read the Queen's Gambit itself for the first one. So that's another way to reach out to people and to stoke an interest in chess in a sort of non-competitive way. And mm -hmm. of course, I'll, I'll link to, to all that stuff. And of course, there's com competition has a welcome place in chess too. But we just we want to have we wanted to we want to um, provide a, a a place where people of all of interest of any angle in chess um, can can find something. Um, and of course, during these COVID times, it's a great time to do it because uh, we can you know people can offer Zoom classes and lectures and stuff, which I know you've been a part of. Um, so let let's get into that, Katarina. So. Jen, can as I, I mentioned. Can I actually yeah. just like plug in last thing? Because what yes. I want to like emphasize and really kind of applaud the movie to, you know, how they kind of portrayed the challenges of navigating and entering the uh, the chess world. Because now I think even coaches who have like 10 boys and one girl, then they can start thinking, you know, how challenging that situation is for the girl and how can they create a very uh, kind of safe and welcoming and good envi environment for uh, for the girl to prosper. So I think that's a really great, um, uh, kind of great theme that they touched on. And one last thing, you know, it's no, also no, no, take your time. <laughs> because what I liked, uh, that I, it really resonated with me, not just like about, you know, the chess, the sport, but really with Beth. Like I remember when she lost in Paris, one of the really important games, and then she's flying back and, you know, she's asked like, you know, what are you going to do? And then she's like, 
I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's like so raw and so authentic. And I think that's what we chess players kind of go through when we finish a difficult tournament because we are like, okay, you know, maybe you lose and like, who are you? Like, you know, you just prepare for this, I don't know, Olympiad or US championship or whatever the big tournament is. And maybe you did not perform as you expected. And like, you know, what should you do? Like, should you continue? Like, are you a failure or should you try to push again? Like, I think that's that's something that really uh, resonated with me. That was very powerful. Yeah. Uh, when I interviewed Frank Brady, I mentioned that Peter Hein Nielsen, that was sort of a critique he had as he felt like, if anything, even given that scene, they they underemphasize this, the struggle of the chess player. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not on your level and I'm not on the player, the level of most of the players I interview, but I feel like when I was playing the most and like, you know, ambitious, like super ambitious about improving, I feel like 20% of the tournaments I played, I wanted to quit chess when it was <laughs> over, you know, and, and I, I love chess. And I feel like that's a totally like, that's basically standard, you know, because losses can be so devastating. So I think even with that scene, they could have done more, but it is good that they at least captured that feeling somewhat. Yeah, I agree. I was I mean, many times in that situation where you are like, okay, I think I'm going to quit. I just need to redirect like this. This is just too painful. Yeah, it's it's just, it never ceases to amaze how much more painful the losses are than like any sort of success you might have. Yeah, because if you win, you're like, yeah, I played well. I did everything correctly. All is good, but normal. But if you lose, okay, the world is just ending on fire. You are just terrible. Like, you know, you don't have the joy of winning compared to how much you have sadness or like annoyance or whatever feeling or emotion you have when you lose. So dare I ask Katarina, what was your darkest moment <laughs> <laughs> in OTP chess? I had, uh, let me think, that's a good question. Well, I had a really kind of important game during my 2000, uh, 2007 World Championship because I was playing around 10 and I was eight out of nine, super wow. cool performance leading. And I was playing uh, Gunina Valentina and I needed to make a draw. And if I made a draw, then I can lose the last round. Doesn't matter. And I'm world champion. And that's pretty cool. And I had white and I played, you know, good opening. I think I won a piece somewhere. Like it, it's incredible. Like I haven't seen that game for some time, but I think I was piece up and I was like, okay, I should win. But I was so nervous because it's world championship, right? I was not used to that kind of pressure and being so good in the tournament and at some moment I think I offered her a draw and I was like okay you are peace down like just accept the draw and you know we go home and she please <laughs> please accept the draw <laughs> because like okay you're peace down like uh and I'm first so that would be good but like she rejected the draw and I was like wow. are you crazy but then I started to question myself like okay is she, can she actually beat me when she's like material down but okay then I messed up and then I lost the game and after that I was like okay I can never win anything I'm just uh I still had a chance to win the tournament if I won the last round, but mentally I was just like, I'm going to lose the next round. This was just like terrible. Uh, yeah. And like, I just started to question everything. Luckily I made a draw in the next round and finished second. But like after that round, just, yeah, like, yeah, I well, didn't second, know who I am. Yeah. I mean, second's an amazing achievement, but that's a devastating story. <laughs> I'm not, not going to lie. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> you, you know, the worst part is at the end of the game, like, Five, five moves before it finished, uh, I was like, you know, much better material, but she was threatening a checkmate with a queen and knight. And I saw the checkmate, but I didn't see how to defend against it because, you know, queen and knight, they are very tricky how they cooperate. But I was like, if she didn't checkmate me, I promote to another queen, like completely winning position. Uh, but I was like, but this is just, so I, I had like two minutes, three minutes. So I just spend all the time I have. I don't see how to defend the checkmate. You know, I make something and I get checkmated. And then I, you know, leave the leave the room, and my coach comes to me, and he's like, um, "You didn't see that she can checkmate you? I mean, it's like hard." I, and I look at him. I was like, "It's not hard. Like obviously, I saw it. Like you know, I get so mad because like he he yeah. feels I didn't see it. I was like, no, obviously I saw it, but like, how do you want to defend? Like there's no defense. I can't move the king. Like it's so stuck that just the knight and the queen checkmates. And then he's like, um." But you had pawn next to your king. Couldn't you just move the pawn? I didn't see that. Oh, brutal. So there was like the brutal ending. Of, and if I just move that pawn, there's no checkmate. I'm promoting to a queen winning. She has like perpetual or something, but I don't care about draw, right? Right. I just didn't see, like my brain just was not waking up that I can move the pawn. So it was like one, you know, 
it was just, it wasn't terrible. No, it wasn't. I'm going to cringe and look through that game when this interview is over. <laughs> I'm just saying, oh, no, now everybody's going to look at the game and see, like, how stupid I was. No. Yeah, that's the chess player feeling. Yeah, that, that, that's what they didn't didn't necessarily capture in uh, in Queen's Gambit. Well, let, well, let's talk about a brighter topic. What's your what's your brightest memory from all of your chess competitions? <laughs> yeah, it's, that sounds better. We um, need a palate cleanser. <laughs> well, uh, the, the next year after uh, this World uh, Championship, I played European Championship. And, you know, for the first time, I felt like I can win, um, which, you know, I played European and World Championships since I was like 10. So under 10, 12, 14, 16, like all the time. But I, ne- I finished like fifth, sixth, tied for fourth, like, you know, never medaled. And I know that it's still a great result. But again, you know, in my mind, it was a failure. Like I can't medal. I just can't be good, you know, and all that. Um, but after this World Championship, I was like, you know, I can medal. So let's try to, you know, repeat that and maybe make it better. So the next year I won European Championship and I felt that um, I really got the power from the World Championship, like the self, um, self-confidence self and the things that I need to uh, I need to improve on. Like, for example, in that last or the 10th game with Gunina, like I had the strength, I had the move there. I, it was on the board. It was just my head who was just not willing to kind of give in or or have the space, like, kind of relax and just think normal. Like, okay, there's a checkmate. Just make a space for the king to run away. Very simple, right? But like, I was so stuck and so stressed out that I think that helped me in the in the next year and I won the European Championship. So I think that was, that's like the whole tournament, right? Because I don't think I can pinpoint one game, but just it's, it's a lot of things that you are going through a tournament when you are leading because every game is a struggle and every game can just bring you down. Yeah, and I think that's a common sort of process for for a top chess player where they have some devastating near miss and they have to regroup over months or years and then finally they get another shot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm con- belated congratulations <laughs> on uh, on winning it. But actually, now I think you know when I think about specific game uh, and guys being nice to me. Uh, so that's like a Venn diagram, right? You need to make it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I remember I played with Karpov. Uh, it was like a tournament. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah amazing. It was just in, it was a tournament like, uh, it was called like Snowdrops versus Old Hands. I think it was 2011, maybe. I mean, 2008, 2008 I think. Eight, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was playing white and it was he, he played French. It was such a cool game. And like it finished in a draw. But like su- in such a way that like I I blocked everything and he couldn't do anything in that game. Like it was just dead draw position and he agreed to the draw. And after the game, we went to analyze it and he just said like, you know, on some moves, like you played really well this. And I was very happy for, you know, I mean, in real game, very classical game to draw with Karpov. That's, that was a huge achievement. And I was especially happy that he kind of gave me credit for some moves. So I think that's. That's one of the really That's good. awesome. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to cross him off the list of uh, potential people who might have said a, the rude comment to Susan Bogart. I don't I don't think it was him anymore. Uh, that, that's great stuff. So Katerina, I want to hear a little about the classes you're doing at the uh, girls Zoom club, but first let's um take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its move trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlson and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. So Katarina, you've also been doing these uh, these classes for the for US Chess um, on Zoom with like lots of uh, strong scholastic players and interested scholastic players for girls in particular. And as I mentioned, Jen has told me that um, that you're quite a popular teacher. So could you tell us a little bit about, about that experience? Uh, it's a wonderful experience. I think we really need to also applaud to Jennifer Shahade, what she's doing for women's chess and for girls' chess. I also taught a couple of classes for the U.S. Chess School for Greg Shahade's classes. Yes. So I feel like I'm just with their siblings now <laughs> within uh-huh. the USEF. Um, but what Jennifer, you know, like we used to work, like I think it was every week class and I would get like 50, 60, 70 girls like joining the class, which is incredible. 
like I don't remember teaching such a big girls class like ever. Like if you think about maybe girls tournaments, you see this many girls. But if it's open tournament, I just don't see that many girls. So first, it's really cute to see, you know, these kids, their rooms. It's just so funny and how they ask questions, how they are interested. Um, but it's also great that we are like building community, like the girls know about each other. And now, you know, I've been teaching for two months, I think, maybe three months uh this class so i'm getting to know these girls like by name and um what are their interests you know what are their openings that they play uh i also see who's really excited into like uh expressing their opinions about chess and i give that space for them to always you know say their opinions then i plug in somebody new you know i gave them like to more people to kind of them have a discussion that it's not just me teaching and me giving them the answer and showing them what's correct, but really them having discussions. And very often they're like, oh, I agree with her, but I also think this. And I think providing this environment where they kind of learn from each other and respect each other, I think it's just so important. And also I think they are empowering each other this way. Yeah, it's great. It's I'm, It's got to be huge because especially as we get back to OTB, um, despite the, the strides that uh, U.S. chess women has made in uh, increasing the amount of participation um, that of females in tournaments, they're still going to be the minority. So, I mean, it's great that when when everyone starts showing up again, they'll feel like, you know, they have their people, they have their support network. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, and what ages uh, are able to attend these classes? I think at first it was supposed to be a teen class. So as long as you are a teenager, I think now it's changed a little bit and she expanded it that even like younger girls could join. So I'm not actually very confident about the requirements, but I'm sure anybody who is interested can email Jennifer, you know, and see um, if their child is eligible. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'll put a link to all this stuff. Um, and as an experienced teacher, I know you also, you've, you've done camps, you know, simuls, uh, all the stuff that, that you would expect. Um, do, do you have a teaching philosophy, a chess improvement philosophy that, that you find yourself harping on? <laughs> so that's a really good question. I think that chess is about, um, you know, helping kids uh, to learn, but helping them to, them to be interested in chess. You know, I don't want them to pick up on my knowledge and start copying it or expanding on it. I want them to become interested in chess and just learning by themselves. So I think that's kind of my philosophy. And that's why I want the classes to be very interactive. And I always want to hear from students. And I think I really got to learn this and experience it when I was doing residency and camps in St. Louis. Uh, because first of all, I mean, they're amazing what they are doing. But also their, you know, staff members are so cool how they are promoting and helping, you know, chess. And the members are picking up on that. So they are so excited about chess and they want to and be engaged and then they want to participate. So I was there, you know, doing residency for, I mean, together probably 11 weeks already over the years. Uh, and it's very interactive. You know, I have them play out position. I have them, you know, speak. I have them uh, kind of, again, critique each other. And it's so much fun. I mean, sometimes we are laughing so hard what somebody is saying or jokes, you know, putting there. So I really want that to be when we are also teaching kids. It's We are not just teaching chess, but we are also teaching all the aspects of what it is to be learning and what it is to be curious about learning something and improving oneself. That's great. Yeah, that's kind of, especially in my work with, with kids as opposed to adults, I, I always try to teach that the, the main the, the number one lesson I'm trying to impart in chess is like knowledge is its own reward, you know, mm -hmm. like something much, you know, much bigger than chess because not everyone is going to be world champion. But if, if that seed can be planted, that hard work can be rewarded and it doesn't have to be a school assignment. Um, that, that to me is, is the ultimate goal. But let's get into the Grandmaster in Residence program that you mentioned at the St. Louis Chess Club. Of course, an awesome program where different uh, chess professionals like yourself are able to, to set up shop. So you must have some, some adult improvers that come through there as well. So um, in terms of, so you try to provide the inspiration for people to be self-directed. Um, but when you're working with, say, older students, um, adult students, wh what direction do you give them? What do you tell them to do in the time where they're not being taught? So uh, that's a very, you know, I, um, that's actually great kind of things you ask about me because I'm interested in teaching kids. It's a lot of fun, you know, all these camps, but I'm also really interested in just uh, teaching adults and elderly people. 
because they think like, okay, I, sometimes I'm old, I'm not good, you know, for playing chess. And for example, in St. Louis, I was, uh, I started a class uh, with, which was called Ladies' Night. It was only for ladies. Guys couldn't enter it. Um, and uh, what was really cool, we were starting to get people. And then once there was a lady who was like around 80, you know, and she came to class to probably pick up, uh, you know, grandchild or something from a chess lesson. And I told her if she would be interested in learning chess. And she was like, no, 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 you know, I'm 80. And I was like, cool. Well, would you be interested in learning chess? And she was like, you didn't hear me. I'm 80 years old. I was like, okay, what does that mean? Are you interested or not? And she was like, right. I am interested, but I'm 80. I was like, it doesn't matter. Like, if you're interested, just join us. Uh, and she, okay, we talked, you know, and at the end of the day, she joined us and, um, and she started loving it. And she was like, you know, I thought I'm not smart enough. Like I'm old. And I was like, no, like those are all biases that are being told. Like you have to be smart. You have to, you know, be great at math. You have to have like spatial visualization, like whatever fancy word you name it. I was like, no, you just, you know, it takes practice. And she started playing. So then anytime somebody else came like, oh, I'm too old. I was like, no, we have a lady who is 80 and she's going, she's coming every week. So you can join. You know, at, at one moment, I think we had like 30 ladies joining the class, which was That's incredible. Awesome. I mean, it, yeah. it didn't hurt that there was free wine and cheese. So I do want to mention <laughs> that. <laughs> Only in St. Louis. <laughs> Only in St. Louis. But, uh, but it was, and he, again, we built a community, you know, and we had so much fun. The girls then started to go out for dinner after the lesson. Uh, then they started to meet at their own time. It, it was fantastic. I do miss that. You know, St. Louis was great in really promoting chess as something that's elegant. It's something that's, uh, you know, really good for your life as fun. It's fun without any other, you know, attached um, kind of goal. Wow. Yeah, that's that sounds awesome. That that must have been must have been a lot of fun. Um, but I'm sure we have some improvers listening, Katarina. So um, we gotta get we gotta get more concrete. Okay. <laughs> do you do you recommend um do you recommend certain books? Um like what do you what do you tell people to study on their own? So I have students like when they ask me this uh this question and they're you know in their like 40s or 50s, and then they say like, Oh, I have this, you know, grandmaster preparation calculation yeah. or whatever. And I was like Wow. Okay. You know, it's pretty hard for me to be studying this book. Uh, like, it's great if you are keeping up with it, but you know, we are fourteen hundred. Uh, so, what if we do something else? So, I think it's really important to scale. You know, what you are supposed to study. So, to be specific, I am a huge fan of the step method. I knew. I know you have a tons of people already saying that on your yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For re for good reason, though. I think I purchased more than like three hundred books already. Like, because anybody I'm teaching is going through that. Like my youngest sister. Uh, who is now 18, so she's not so young anymore, uh, but she came through the whole thing. Like, oh, you know, wow. when she was, I think, I don't know, nine, 10, we found the book in Germany, in German language. Uh, it was pretty new. We started on that. And I mean, you know, she won Czech championships many times, even for boys category. Uh, she's now in the national team, but she went through that. She solved, you know, all the books. So I think it's really good method to, to just start uh, doing. And even if I'm teaching some older people, I always recommend to get the book. I think that's a great start to yeah. you know have your kind of tactical basis covered. Yeah, and for any listeners who haven't heard prior conversations about the step method, it's um Dutch based uh, sort of it's the idea is for it to be sort of a, a holistic chess curriculum that can take you from beginner to 2200. So, you know, it's it's very well well organized and presented. Um, of course, it does help if you have a teacher helping you. But um, I've been been trained in teaching step method and a big advocate as well. Um, so what else? Any any other um, favorite favorite books. What about for you? So you come from a huge chess family. What were you guys doing as, as kids? <laughs> so, you know, I, uh, we've been, so we are seven kids, right? So when I was growing up, we are just four because we have kind of a break there, but we would play against each other, like practice a little bit. Then it was starting to get competitive and we, nobody wanted to lose. So we just stopped playing ultimately. Uh, but we were joining a club. So we are playing a lot. So I think, you know, if you want to improve, just play, you know, play, play and also do tactics. Now there's tons of material like there. You have streamers, right, to do Twitch content. Um, I know the book is great. Uh, the I think it's called The Mammoth of Chess. Like just going through Mammoth, game. Yeah. Yes. Bur Burgess and, uh, and M's, I think. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. But just yeah. going through that, it, sometimes it's inspiring because, wow, like these combinations, that's incredible that it actually happened. Uh, so that book is great. Other book, just like, you know, if you have like 60 games of, I don't know, Fisher or Capablanca or, you know, whatever, just going through the games. 
like sometimes you know you can like sometimes I skip the commentary. I mean, everybody did that, right? Right. Uh, so, I, but the thing is, you are going through it, and the more games accurately play you see, your brain is picking up on patterns. And then you know when you play a game, it's going to generate moves that make sense based on what you've seen. So the more you go over, just I recommend to get the book. You know play it on a chessboard. I know there is like tons of books of, on chessable, but I think there is something special when you actually make the moves on the board. I am a believer in that. I oh think no, you're one of those people who yes. can make me feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am that person that anytime I'm traveling to like uh, team events, like Olympiad, you know, or uh, European Championship when I was playing for Czech or World Championship, I always bring a board. And sometimes I'm the only player. player. It's, right. it's really funny because they're like, oh, you want to play, you know, Blades. Can you give us a board? I was like, Nobody else has a board here, you know? <laughs> well, you're, you're not speaking like an American in that one because, you know, all the Europeans make fun of us Americans because only in America do you bring your own set to every tournament. You know? Okay, but th that's ridiculous because you, like, <laughs> set it up before the round and you bring your clock. I mean, okay, that's... Uh, I mean, it took a lot of time, you know, to get used to that. Plus, sometimes I would play, like, with, like, white and green squares or something. You know, like you can have all the colors. So once I played a Simo and there were like all the colors you could see, I would I would play like purple against pink. I was like, okay, who is black here? You know, because the purple was actually lighter than the pink. It was very dark. It's like, so who is white? And I had so much headache from that Simo because like just getting used to like green, purple, yellow, you know, all it was. Yeah, that's that's a little crazy about America. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes getting used to for sure. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by a new sponsor, aimchess.com. As fate would have it, I had actually just subscribed to the site a few days before they reached out to me about advertising. A few of my chess friends on Twitter have been talking about it. And what it does is it collects your games from the major sites. You don't have to upload them. It just gathers them itself and then gives you uh, data based on how you play, what aspect of the game you need to work on most, whether it be tactics, opening, or end games. And it even has tailored lessons based on what it gathers. There's a free version and a paid version as well, so you can check it out for free. And then if you like it and you decide to subscribe, you can get a 30% discount if you use the promo code CHESS30, and then they'll know you're coming from Perpetual Chess. So go to aimchess.com, use the promo code CHESS30, info in the show notes, and then let me know what you guys think. All right, back to the show. So Katarina, you mentioned, of course, playing in tournaments. Um, and I was um, checking out your chess babes profile. And as far as I can tell, you played your last tournament in 2019. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That was so the World Team Championship. So we know you're busy with graduate school. What's going on with your game generally? Yeah, I I put chess on hold a little bit. I also feel like I have still a little complicated relationship with chess. Uh, so when I decided to start grad school, I mean, PhD, then I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop chess on a little bit and just focus on school and then maybe see if I come back to that world of an, or not. But I got, uh, yeah, in 2019, I got uh, an invitation to play for the U.S. team at the World Team Championship. And first of all, I was so surprised to get the invitation because only the first five get the invitation. And I'm like number seven or eight or, you know, you drop and you don't play. Um, so I was so excited because I love team events. They're more important for me than individuals. You know, I come from a family of seven. So every time there is like a team happening, it just means a lot to me. So I was like, wow, maybe I want to play that. But like, you know, I can take off two weeks of school. Like I was teaching my own class. Like you can find sub for two weeks. Plus I'm paid for, you know, teaching and doing research, you not know, to be traveling and playing chess. Um, but then I checked the time and I saw that one of the weeks is during my spring break week which is fantastic. So that means, you know, I'm missing only one week for school and the week before the spring break of, or after a spring break, like students are just not really mentally present. So that's kind of helping me for, you know, being easy on that. Um, so then I was like, you know, I, I feel like I really want to play that. And I spend a lot of time thinking if I should be playing that world championship because just because you want to doesn't mean that you are really kind of qualified and you should accept that invitation. I wasn't sure if it's responsible for me and like for the US team, am I going to be an addition that's, you know, worth playing or am I just going to like, you know, get the spot because I was nominated. So I spent a lot of time thinking from like ethical perspective in a way, if it's, wow. if it's the right thing to do. Um, and I talked to my brother and my, my parents. And then I was like, you know, I feel I really want to. And then they were like, okay, you got the invitation. So, you know, uh, 
you deserve it or something. So I decided to play and, and it was fantastic. I did well there. We did as a team well there. And I mean, I had so like, so I had actually some crazy stories there. <laughs> so, so it was just like amazing. I was so happy to be also back in the chess world after, because the, the tournament before that was also another world team championship two years before that. So like mm-hmm. it was, I was just so happy to be back and see other chess players and I enjoy it, but um, yeah, that was my last tournament, and I don't know when it's when the next one is going to be. Yeah, I love the team tournaments as well. Can you share any of these crazy stories you alluded to? <laughs> yeah, so uh, our team was there. Uh, so it was uh, Tatev Abrahamian was first board. I was second board. Karis Sayep was third board. Um, then Rochelle. Well, you, no, Rochelle. Rochelle. Wu, Roche- I- yeah, Rochelle Wu, she was, I don't know if she was fifth or Sabina Foyser was fifth, but one of them was just there. Uh, so these girls are super young, right? Like they're like teenagers. Uh, so for example, you know, there was one day when the girls were just like coming after, you know, every Chesper and asking them like, do you love me? Oh God. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you go to like Alex Onischuk or like Ray Robson, like, do you love me? Do you like, and like the players are just like, who are these? But the girls are super strong chess players, right? So it's kind of so weird. Like they are so yeah. childish, but then, uh, and then they come to Darius Sviert and they're like, oh, Darius, do you love me? And like Carissa says that, and, you know, Rochelle repeats it and Darius looks at them and he's like, um, you know, girls, love is a very strong word. <laughs> <laughs> It was just so funny. And, you know, another day we would go and we always took a bus, like two minutes bus to the playing hall. And uh, it was just a mini bus only for our U.S. team. And you would just sit wherever you want, but the girls would always sit in the back and kind of make noise. So the more it annoyed you to, you know, the closer to the driver you would sit. Uh, And I was like, I don't care. You know, I have sisters. I'm I'm used to all kind of crazy stuff. But this one day, suddenly, you know, I think Carissa is asking Alex, like, Alex, do you want to sing with us? This is on a shot. Alex on his joke, yeah. yeah. And I mean, we are going to the round, right? World championship, like it's super serious. And Alex was like, you know, girls, I don't think we're going to fa- find a match between the songs we know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> such a serious voice. And, and the girls were like, no, no, we're going to teach you. Like, it's really fun and it's easy song. And Alex, like, I don't know what's happening. was like, yes, yeah, sure. So he joins them. And, uh, and Carissa was like, okay, we're going to sing a song, Baby Shark. And all these... And, you know, they start singing Baby Sharks and Alex on his tube joins them. And suddenly for the drive of like three minutes, they are all singing Baby Sharks. Well, anyone <laughs> with young kids knows that song, whether they want to or not. I know, sure. but in that moment, you know, I'm focusing on playing the Russians or something. And <laughs> yeah. I see like Alex on his tube, he's the head coach of like Texas Tech, right? And right. I like, so I'm like, whoa, who are we people? Like what's <laughs> happening? Uh, and then, you know, we reach the playing hall and I come to Alex. And I was like, Alex, how are you going to play the game now? Like, I'm going to have Baby Shark for two days to come. Like, uh, and he was but I didn't mention the baby shark. I was like, how are you going to play now? Like the song, it must be in your head. And he just turns on, on me and he's like, uh, what was the song? I kind of forgot. I was like, oh, wow. w- like we think about chess players having great memory. And now he doesn't remember this song that has two words. You know, I was like, no, just everything was. <laughs> and then we had one time we were um, preparing. So our captain was uh, Malik Kachian and our coach was Alejandro Ramirez. So mostly we were preparing, I think, or me with Alejandro, or I was with my coach and sometimes with Alejandro. But suddenly, you know, I come for like to check on my prep and I go to Alejandro's room and I see like Tatev preparing there. And there's also Carissa and Rochelle. And I'm like having such a great mood and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to win this game. And he was like, okay, so what's your preparation? I was like, B3, bam, what's your move? And he's like looking at me like, B3, that's that's your winning move here, like with playing white. I was like, yeah. And then we start playing and suddenly, uh, you know, Carissa is like, oh, girls, do you know this song? And she plays something crazy. And we were like, no, we don't know. And then, um, you know, Rochelle, she was like, you know how long I can hold plank? I can hold for 15 minutes. So now Carissa is doing, I mean, Rochelle is doing plan, plank. Carissa is timing her playing crazy song. I'm this like, is a, this is a yoga pose. We should <laughs> clarify. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I am, uh, I am, you know, saying like I'm gonna win B- with B3. And at one moment, Alejandro is like, "Stop, stop! What's happening here?" <laughs> like, right. like, because again, like you know, we are the US team, but like it's such a crazy thing that's happening. So, no, it was, I mean, it's great memories. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I asked about the stories. 
<laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, everyone seems so serious all the time, but I guess not necessarily. Um, and of course, also, I'm jealous of all the Olympiads that you've gotten to play in. Um, they, they always seem the most fun to me. I'm always asking guests who've gotten to play in them about uh, stories and reflections. So do you have any similarly crazy stories from, <laughs> from those days? Um, let me think. I mean, Olympiads are, are fantastic. That's just the events you really want to play. They have the power. Everything that's being taught about them is it, fantastic. Yeah. I wish one day Chess is going to join the official Olympiads because yeah. that would be my dream come true. Like I would work so hard to be on that Olympiad with like, you know, all the other sports. Um, yeah. Sorry, I should actually explain. They're basically the Chess Olympics for anyone who hasn't heard about them, but it's, but as Katarina is alluding to, the the appeal is that you represent your country and you play as a team side by side. Um, and it's in a different, often cool place, often Conti Mansisk on the other hand, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, every, every time they do it. So anyway, sorry, go on, Katarina. Yeah, so I played Olympia since 2008. So I played in Germany, then I played in Istanbul, in Conti Mansisk, in Tromso, and in Baku. That was my last one. Yeah, so I think my first one was actually the worst one, but I think that was kind of the introduction. But uh, the thing was, I didn't play very well there. The team was kind of, we didn't have a great uh, kind of team spirit. But the funny part was we were kind of located in this hotel, which was called like Hotel de Art in Dresden. And it was very artistic hotel in every sense. And, you know, the first was when we entered the, our room and we realized the room is pretty small but the room is as big as the bathroom. And we were like, okay, this makes like zero sense. Like why the bathroom is so big when we barely can move in, you know, where we have a huge bed. And then we saw this huge window in the, in the bathroom that was going to the like living room that was see-through and it would like look at your shower. And I'm like, okay, I'm there with my roommate. <laughs> like, right. like this wow. is, so like for like 15 minutes, we were looking for the bathroom when you like made it shady. So you don't see it. Right. So it's like, okay, that's, then we couldn't find any closet. And we're like, okay, where is the closet here? Like, but then we found out that when you move uh, the table too much, their closets open. Then there is like a thing when you rotate a seat, it's a trash can. It's like, I mean, it's great, but how does that make sense? Like, how often are you going to rotate your trash can? Like, if every time you want to go to your uh, to your closet, you need to move the table. Like, you can have anything on the table. Like, it was just so crazy. I was like, who designed this hotel? I mean, wow. and every time when we had a team meeting, like somebody would discover something. And sometimes it was the girl, sometimes it was the guy's team. So I think that was um, that was really funny. So sometimes we we are just like, okay, these hotels are very interesting. We get that exposure. But you probably mean like with chess kind of stuff. So um, I know in Baku, like I had, a, you know, I was usually preparing with Robert Hess, who was our coach there. But one day I know that my opponent, she was playing, I know it was Karukan. No, no, it was, yeah, I think it was Karukan. And Robert was like, you know, Yasser plays this opening. And we saw that he had a lot of, a uh, lot of games in with black and I was white. So we were like, you know, uh, maybe I'm going to go and prepare with Yasser this time. And uh, he's going to tell me what he hates, you know, when he plays black and I'm going to play with white. The logic is sound. So, so I knocked on his door and I, you know, asked him if he could like tell me more about this, this opening. And he starts talking about how amazing that opening is for black and how he loves playing it and how it's really difficult for white to be very precise. Uh, and after 15 minutes, I was, I'm like, yes, sir, stop. I'm playing that for white. Do you, <laughs> do you understand that? Like, I, I don't, I, I don't need that at its stress. So I was just like, you know, I, this, and he was like, no, I just want to show that it's a not bad an opening for black. Maybe you want to play it for black one day. Like maybe one day, but now I'm playing it for white. <laughs> 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 so so after I was like, no, I, I have to leave. So I went back and I said, Robert, I, I can't do this. Like he's just showing me, you know, how great it's for black. So we just picked a line that looked normal for white, and you know, and we continued. But uh, but it was, I think it was the only time I prepared with the Astra. I, I mean, the Astra is amazing and. That's right. so much for women chess. I don't want to put him in a bad spot. But like, if you think that, you know, a preparation is going to help you because he plays that the opposite color, like, no, 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 that's, that's not the way to go. That's very funny. And did you, did it, was it in your head during the game? Did you manage to, to like get it out of your head once you sat down to play? Well, luckily she, she didn't play Karukan at all. And I was like really happy because I was just terrified if we actually go to that Yasser's opening because it is in your head like, okay, it's maybe really strong. It's difficult for me, you know, and, and why not? So I was like, oh, she played, you know, I don't know, 
D6 or something. I was like, oh, now it's going to be totally fine. <laughs> it's like no reason to think that, but <laughs> that's, yeah, that was the situation. Good stuff. And if you were to, so are you officially representing the U.S. now for anything? Like, would you still be able to play for the Czech Republic uh, at the next uh, real Olympiad or would it be for the U.S.? Yeah, I'm playing for U.S. since like, okay. 2000. I don't know, 13, I think. That's, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I did see that you weren't in the, the U.S. Uh, women's championship this year, which was done online. Um, if you don't mind my asking, was that, did you, did you not make the cut or just have too much going on with, uh, with your academic uh, workload? Yeah, that's another kind of uh, thing when we think about the difficulties of a chess player. So uh, I was nominated. I made a cut for, I think I was like number eight or something for the U.S. championship. But, you know, they send the invitation in, in the beginning of January and the tournament is supposed to be in April. So there is little you know, of how much you know. And I was supposed to do my composition PhD exams during that time. I was also teaching a class standalone. Uh, so I was worried that I may just not be able to attend that tournament in, in April. And I was thinking whether I should like, you know, accept it and then maybe reject it month later when I know exactly when my exams are going to be. But then I was like, let's not do that. Let's just, let's just say no, because I can't commit to it 100% right now. So I declined the invitation, but then, you know, the US, USCF changed the, the event, like they completely changed the platform. It's not in, uh, you know, St. Louis, it's online, it's virtually, they changed the format, like it's not two week event, it's like a rapid. So they changed yeah. everything about it's the month, tournament. Months later too. Yeah, like many months later, like four yeah. months later, right? So they changed everything about the tournament, but they do not resend the invitation. Yeah. So I was kind of disappointed in that because I would love to play yeah. and uh, I would definitely accept that invitation. I just couldn't commit to be, you know, to travel to St. Louis for two weeks during school semester. Yeah. Well, as you probably know, the same thing happened to Fabiano Caruana, right? I mean, in the men's event. like he oh, had I, a, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. He had another commitment, another international tournament in, I think it was April when it was originally supposed to be. So he turned down his invitation and then he's sitting there watching like the rest of us. Uh, and I was watching um, Chess Dojo did, a, um, you know, Jesse Cry and Kostya Kowalski and David Proust when they were doing one of their sort of uh, Chess in the News recap shows, they were debating whether they were going to find a way to get Fabiano in at the last minute. But I think it's to to their credit, to the St. Louis Chess Club and Rex Singfeld's credit, that they didn't like strong arm someone into but dropping out in order to get Fabiano in. Although for you, they probably should have made someone drop out. But I mean, I understand both points of view. Uh, yeah. I just think if you change everything about the tournament, uh, like including the venue, the time, the setting, it's not it's virtual, like it's too much of a change that I think the players deserve to have a ch second chance of, you know, deciding whether they accept or not. Because, you know, another learning from that could be there is if I sign the contract that I'm going to play in the U.S. championship and I withdraw a week before, like there's no punishment for me. There's just like they're going to hate me. Right. Right. But then for the next time, it's like, is that worth it? Because there is a chance you are actually going to keep playing. So, like, you know, you want to be nice for the players and for the alternate who are going to get the spot so they know it uh, way ahead. But then that doesn't pay off when they change the location, the time and everything about the tournament. So, yeah, I think I was, yeah, it was hard because people were like, oh, are you watching? I was, I was like, no, I'm not watching. I, <laughs> I wish I was playing. Stop asking me. And then I was like, oh, I'm so sorry you didn't make the cut. And I was like, <sighs> <laughs> I would make the cut. It just, <laughs> please, yeah. So, you know, that's the time, like this is going on and a lot of things like Corona is going on and it's just, it's not helping your mental health sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that makes things sense. happen. Yeah. And to be clear, when I was mentioning the Fabiano thing, uh, the chess dojo guys were talking about it like a day or two before the, like, would they still find a way in? I, I agree with you that maybe they should have just expanded the field, I think, like so that everyone who was originally invited might get a second chance to join. And they don't, also don't have to kick out anyone who, um, you know, was an alternate initially and got in. Um, and that's a great thing you can do when it's all virtual. Like you are not paying for the hotel. You're you're just like adding a board and maybe a little price money, but not even that much. So yeah, I think I, that's, that's a great thing about like now moving to virtual. Yeah, like although that. the prize money is not nothing, you know. I mean, so it's easy for me to sit here and say it. You know? <laughs> um, um, well, hopefully we'll get to see you in it next year, and hopefully it will be in real life. <laughs> um, yeah, I look forward to playing. You know, now I feel... I mean, again, you know, the 
Uh, I think now how chess is booming, like everybody wants to play the Queen's Gambit. You know, everybody's like, I just posted a cover like on my Facebook, like playing chess and saying like, oh, it's really good to be, you know, woman grandmaster. And I got like 150 likes. I'm like, right. whoa. Like now I think so many people are admiring like, you know, chess and women's chess strength. And, you know, they want to know more about chess. So again, like coming back to Queen's Gambit, it's just incredible time now for chess and uh, for learning, playing, coaching, everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that brings up the thought you're in the home stretch of your PhD. We don't have to get into that if you don't want to. I, I <laughs> Please don't ask about my dissertation, no. <laughs> but, but I am more curious what your sort of professional plans are generally. I mean, I know you're doing a lot of coaching, but you also have your uh, parallel academic career. And now you're, you're mentioning um, playing OTB when you can. So how do you envision the, the next uh, handful of years playing out for you professionally, Katerina? Um, that's a good question. And honestly, I don't really know. Uh, I can't tell right now. I just know that I came through time like, uh, you know, when I finished uh, UTB, uh, my undergrads in Texas, I wanted to just quit chess, like cold, cold turkey, just like done. Then I went to Webster. I was just like kind of thinking maybe I can play again. And then I was like, I'm OK, I guess, but I need to take a break. Uh, and now I'm in the moment like, I like chess again, you know, it's, yeah. it's cool to play. So, uh, you know, you're going through all these stages as a professional player because there is a lot of, you know, things happening to you, people saying stuff, and uh, it's hard to be, you know, competitive player in any sport or to just, you know, strive to to be good and then be judged by others. It, it's just really hard. So um, now I think I'm in a better place to, like, enjoying chess and thinking about, you know, doing things. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to be nice because I'm very interested in what I'm studying. I'm studying communication. I'm very interested, you know, how, how we can help people. I'm more now focusing on social support, you know, how especially to help people in crisis. And I have background in nursing. So, oh, that's, really? so that's kind of, you know, the direction I think is also very important. And through chess, I started to also think more about like mental health and how, you know, that's impacting players and everybody. But like how hard it's to deal with that when you are alone. And me being international student and being in, you know, U.S. for the past 10 years alone and always like, you know, I came to Brownsville, Texas, knowing nobody. Right. I went to Webster knowing about Susan, but knowing about knowing about Anna Sherevich and maybe a couple of players, but not knowing anybody. And you always come to these new places, building new relationship, like shaping your identity, kind of figuring who you want to be. You know, then I went to Arizona knowing nobody. Um, so you spend a lot of time kind of alone and kind of trying to build relationships. Uh, so I can see how challenging is that. And I want to be, you know, maybe able to, uh, to help other people in that direction. Wow. Yeah, that that's great. Yeah. And of course, chess has provided you some, some opportunity. I presume that uh, it was chess that enabled you to go to uh, university of Texas at Brownsville and, and Webster, but but yeah, I mean, uh, we've had a lot of uh, guests sort of from the Ukraine and, of course, many other Webster students like your friend, I am Eric Rosen. Um, and yeah, it can be a big culture shock depending on where you're coming from. And even if you're from the U.S., I mean, so, some of the schools sort of, um, you know, you might be a little bit separate as a chess player from the larger student body or, or you know, there's just various issues that people need help with. Absolutely, because you, when you are doing chess for a team, like, okay, you have your academics and everybody care about that, but you also have chess where you really have to work hard and you are traveling and, you know, you are, have to, like, manage uh, your life and, like, kind of really focus on, like, I cared a lot about academics. And I think what chess players don't realize when they go to, uh, to U.S., they are like, at least that was me and I see it for others as well. Like, I'm going to, you know, really focus on chess and kind of finish the degree because I have to. And then they come, they join the university and they're like, oh, wow, that academic environment is incredible. The people are so supportive. Like, I want to learn this, like, okay, this and that. And then you're like, I really, so you spend a lot of time for your academics and you also want to keep up with your chess, but then, then you have no time for personal life, yeah. you know, and then, and just managing that, balancing it's, it is very challenging, but now you can see a lot of players, strong players are going for their masters, their PhD, and everybody's like, do you want to play chess? And now, you know, so um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's one thing that players need to think about when they are also joining university, that they may be super excited and interested in their field afterwards. Yeah, which is a good problem to have. I mean, it's always <laughs> nice to have options. I remember when I interviewed 
Eric Rosen, uh, you know, he's been on the show twice as a guest and once as a reporter from the, uh, from the world championships in 2018. And I was interviewing him right when he was finishing up college and he was like, I might pursue photography, you know, might pursue web design, maybe I'll pursue chess. And all of a sudden he's like a Twitch and YouTube superstar. So <laughs> yeah, he, he's such a star, star now. And yeah, Eric is like such a great friend and, you know, we were neighbors for some time. So we spent a lot of time together and I have actually a cool story, like from 2000, I think it was 2016. Like it was before, um, it was like in around six or seven or something. And I was, uh, I was in my hotel room and I was actually also with my sister and I'm, he was my second there helping me prepare sometimes. And suddenly my computer crashes and like, I, so I, I try to restart it, but it just like dies. So I like plug it in, plug it out, wait 30 minutes, nothing. The computer is just dead. And I'm like, okay, so my preparation is gone for the rest of the tournament. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I guess, call Eric if he can help me and bring computer. So I call him and he was like, yeah, sure. You know, I have a spare computer I'm going to give you. Um, so I'm going to be there like in, you know, one hour or something. I'm going to stop by Trader Joe's. Do you want something? So I, you know, give him my list because I love that store. And then he comes back in like one hour and he's like, okay, here's your computer. So you can prep, you know, tell me if you, we would practice the game after or, you know, play Blitz. And then he was like, and this is, this is the list what you want it, you know? So I bought it. I also know you like this juice. So I bought this stuff. Oh, and nice. and it's so nice. And then, you know, we prepare, we play the, we, we play the games and then he leaves and my sister is just like, who is this guy? He shops for you. He brings you a computer. He bring, he does your preparation. Then he leaves. And like, no, she was like amazed. And it was like, he's such a nice guy. Like he's been so helpful, you know, for so many tournaments and such a kind guy. And I'm so happy. And I'm, you know, he works hard for his stream. Like I remember I was doing some commentary for Scholastic Chess or even for St. Louis. And like, you know, we would finish the commentary, which would last like three hours. I we would go back, you know, to the chess house, for example. I would go and take a nap and he would go and listen to that commentary. Wow. And, and I was like, Eric, I hate hearing my voice. Can you just stop? Like, we just finished the commentary. And he was like, no, I want to see, you know, what mistakes we made, what the chat said. I want to learn from it. I was like, wow, that's dedication, you know, like. Wow. So he... He, he really works hard. Like he, he loves that. And I'm so that, happy he's now doing well. Yeah. I'm happy to see it too. I mean, I don't know him as well as you, but a uh, great guy. I've never heard anyone say a bad word about him, but that's a, that's a uh, crazy story. I mean, that, that really shows the, the work ethic behind the scenes. Yeah. And it also shows, you know, at Webster, we had a green, uh, we had a great kind of team spirit. I have one more story I want to say it was like, I think 2000, also 16, I think championship. And uh, okay. So the Eric was probably, year before uh because it was definitely 2016 and i had a free day and i was about to play jennifer you in the next round you know for the free day i decided to come back to webster office and meet my friends talk to susan and paul and i just joined right after they had like a team practice so there were all the gms or my friends um and suddenly i'm i think asking like liam like one liam right he's super 2700 and i was like you know i'm playing jennifer you tomorrow this is what she plays Maybe do you have some suggestions? You know, I feel free day. I just wanted to like brainstorm. And suddenly like, so we sit down, we we look at some lines and then all the players join. Like even Ray is there, Alex Shimanov, uh, Ilya Nizhnik, like all the GMs are like, oh. And then they start arguing like, no, this line is not good. And I was like, I want to play something aggressive, but not too risky. And then they show a line. I was like, no, that's kind of too not risky. That's too quiet. And then uh, Alex Shimanov is like, oh, you know, I played this this opening in one of the blitz games or tournament uh, and he shows me the opening and i was like wow this is really cool and then he continues with the la line and he's like you know if white is not not careful like this is can happen and like there's a huge attack on the queen side on the king side for black and then the players were like kind of disagreeing but then we d dig down a little bit deeper to that line and i was like no no i love this i'm, I'm just gonna play that tomorrow so i come back you know that day um i look at the line and I'm just like playing, you know, if she makes this very natural move, she gets into bad position. But let's let's go, you know, a little deeper, a couple moves. Um, and okay, I prepare. The same thing happens next day. My prep is until like move 19 or something, like winning position. But it's like she made the first 10, 11 moves that like Alex showed me on a board. And then I played like, okay, this is not good, but it's a very natural move to make. And I just guessed like five moves in a row that she made. And I'm just winning. And I was wow. like, you know, so, so the next time I say, Alex, like that, that's your win. Like, thank you so much, you know? So 
I think at Webster, it was like every time we played US Championship, it was not just me. It was like Ray was there, Anna was there. The guys were ready to help. Susan was, you know, sometimes picking up for like dinner. Paul was there. So it was it was more than just me playing. It was just, it was fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. I do miss these times. Yeah, that that's great to hear. It makes, makes me hope you get back in back into it. <laughs> Although I guess it won't be, you'll still have your Webster friends, but you won't, you won't yeah. be a student. Um, like you have your Webster family kind of forever. Hopefully. Awesome. All right. Well, Katarina, we hit all the topics on my outline. Is there anything else uh, you, you'd like to discuss before we uh, call it a day? Um, I don't know. I just want to, you know, shout out to, yeah, Eric Rosen doing great stuff and everybody else on Twitch, Jennifer Shahadi, Greg Shahadi, just amazing. You know, Jenny and Rex Sinkfeld for just creating St. Louis. And, and, you know, it changed my perception of chess. I start really feeling like, I'm appreciated there. I I love hanging around with chess people. I loved working there, chess coaching chess. It really helped me to find uh, a way back to chess after not such a great experience in Texas. Uh, so, and I mean, what they did overall for US Championship and all, all us there. So yeah, huge thanks to them. And I think that's what I want to probably finish on. Excellent. And um, I know you've got Elite Chess Coaches page. You have a Twitter and a Facebook account. Is there a preferred way for people if they want to reach out to you, whether about uh, lessons or anything else? Probably the fastest way is through Twitter. <laughs> I love Twitter. But yeah, you know, uh, Lee Chess, Chess.com, Chess City, all that works. Chess City. I don't know. If, uh, oh, Chess City, right. Um, that's funny because you're. I feel like you're kind of quiet on Twitter. I mean, I'm not, I'm just like retweeting and liking uh -huh. uh, and I just like love the content there. I mean, it's, it's so hilarious. And in this difficult time, like you need to cheer up. You need to see something crazy uh, during elections. Like you need to be, you know, uh, on, on the right, <laughs> how to say that. Uh, you need to know what's happening. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I don't tweet too much. That's right. But I'm there uh, quite often. Cool. Well, I will link to all this stuff. And Katerina, this has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all your stories and your, your Queen's Gambit analysis and everything else. Thank you so much for having me. And shout out to you. You know, you're doing amazing work. I told you before, like, you inspired me to kind of start my own podcast. I feel like you're an inspiration to so many uh, players to continue with chess to improve. So thank you so much for everything you're doing for chess, for the chess community and uh, future strong grandmasters. Yeah, thank you. I, l I love doing it. So it's uh, it's no chore at all. Although, mm -hmm. so following up on your podcast, because I did mention it to Patreon subscribers. So if you're scratching your head, wondering why, why we didn't talk <laughs> about it, it's because it turns out that Katarina isn't the host, isn't the host, you're more like an overseer of your sister's podcast, which is in the Czech language, correct? Correct. Yes. We are a team of six players. Uh, I mean, not players. Uh, I'm too much in the chess world now. <laughs> no, uh, six people. And I'm the one who's like managing it. And then we have four hosts and one social media person. Okay. So anyone listening um, who speaks Czech will link to it, but that's probably <laughs> not most of you. So <laughs> Probably so, not. <laughs> yeah. So we'll leave it there. And thanks again, Katarina. Thank you so much. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, telling your friends, writing positive reviews on podcast platforms. All of that stuff helps. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1. Join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can find the link on the website. And we are back in action on Instagram, at Perpetual Chess, sharing a weekly clip from the podcast. So follow us over there as well. But of course, the main purpose of these credits is to thank everyone who makes the show possible by their financial support. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And for that, I am forever grateful and work to continually improve and expand the offerings from Perpetual Chess. So without further ado, I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Deaths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, Derek Jones, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfs, Greg Shahadi, 
Gregory Gulick, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John Mar- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Peter Sodi, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hampton Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Payhouse, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach J's Chess Academy, Corey Budson, Costa Chorus, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Douglas Matthew, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Emmanuel Langlois, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrick Ryland, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gene Stewart, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Renivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovacs, Jacob Turan, Jacques Perry, James Espinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J.J. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, John Tully, Juan Almaguer, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurty, Jonathan Slater, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Boyce, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gada of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Miller, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Tempo, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walder, Shane Unger, the Sil- Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of of chess1000.com and of course Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening everyone. We will be back next week with another episode of Perpetual Chess.